Hello, my name is Roger Jacoby, and I am the VP of Business Development for a company called Fiscal Advantage. This presentation is going to give you a little bit of the background and history behind Fiscal Advantage, how we recently got acquired by Pacific Advisors, and how we are working with Vistage groups across the country. Basically, Fiscal Advantage was founded shortly after the 2008 market crash. There's a guy by the name of Dan O'Connell, and if you decide to work with us, you'll get the chance to meet Dan. Dan had spent about 20 years running his own M&A firm here in the Midwest. Basically, after the market crash, Dan put some real serious thought into what he wanted to do next in his life, and he realized he had this incredible passion to come alongside and help small to medium-sized businesses improve their financial performance. He realized that small to medium-sized businesses simply didn't have the tools they needed to understand their financial performance the way the big companies did. And he said it as his goal and his passion to develop those tools so that he and Fiscal Advantage could come alongside small to medium-sized businesses and help them find ways to improve cash flow, profitability, and business value. Over the last 10 years or so, a significant investment has been made in developing the systems to do so. And today, the core business strategy of Fiscal Advantage is where we are engaged kind of like a business's external financial analyst. We meet with the business every quarter. We help them with everything from uh, analyzing margins to budgeting to forecasting to working with lenders to business valuations. We do a whole myriad of financial analysis to come alongside and help businesses grow in ways that in with knowledge that they didn't have before. Well, it turned out that uh, about a year ago, we acquired by a company called Pacific Advisors. As you can see here, Pacific Advisors is a large financial services firm. And as you might guess, they're along the West Coast from Seattle all the way down to San Diego. In, as they used our software on a, some of their 10,000 business owner clients, they were really impressed to see the response of their business owner clients to the kinds of help and advice and insights that we were able to provide them. And as the commercial goes, they liked it so much, they basically bought the company. So it turns out that the CEO of Pacific Advisors is a gentleman by the name of Kelly Kidwell. Kelly, Kelly is a Vistage member in Southern California, and after acquiring our company, he talked to both his Vistage chair and even a little bit to corporate and learned that many Vistage groups across the country really would like a methodology to improve their financial discussions within their group. The problem was is that our normal product offering of offering a year long and all kinds of intensive services was considerably more complex and in depth than any Vistage group could get into. So we were challenged to come up with a simplified version just that maybe like the top 10% of what we do to be able to work with Vistage groups and their members. And as a side note, um, both Kelly is, a, is an approved Vistage speaker and his uh, managing partner, Eric McDermott, as well as myself, and what historically Pacific Advisors has talked to Vistage groups about is, and is how to keep more money of what you earn, or the way I like to word it, how not to send as much money to Washington, because we've seen what great jobs they've done with what we're already selling, that sending them. So anyway, as we look at the product offering of a financial services firm does. They often are into tax and helping with compensation and protection. And what they saw in fiscal advantage was the ability to add performance metrics to their product offering to really help businesses in a way that, quite honestly, most financial for services firms aren't able to help today. So as we were challenged to take our broad product offering and bring it down to a level where we could work with Vistage groups, what we realized is that as we look at our financial statements, one of our real challenges as CEOs is how do we know what we're doing great and where might be some opportunities for improvement. And in order to keep it at a high enough level, we've actually taken and distilled, if you will, all of the financial statements down to something we call the seven cash 
drivers. Now, if you think about it, cash only comes in or goes out of a business through seven accounts on the financial statements. Now, there's no great surprise here. These are standard accounts found on the income statement and the balance sheet. When we look at the income statement, we're looking at sales, cost of goods sold, and operating expenses. And when we're looking at those accounts, what we're really trying to focus in is something we call margin impact. How can we help the business drive more profitability to the bottom line? When we move to the balance sheet, we can see that we focus on the three accounts that drive cash, specifically receivables, inventory, and payables. And when we analyze these three accounts, we're basically looking to help the business improve its cash flow. The seventh account, and again, there's only seven accounts where cash comes in or goes out of a business, and some businesses don't have a lot, but clearly some businesses have a significant amount of capital expenditures. So as we look at capital expenditures and we look at the industry averages, we're basically looking to see how the business utilizes its assets compared to their peers in their product sector. So as we look at the seven cash drivers, we want to monetize them so that we can actually help the business understand the value and the monetary uh, of making improvements. So I'm going to introduce you to a fairly simple equation. The first element of the equation is something that's attainable. Now I'm going to defend or define this in much greater detail in a couple of slides, but for right now, attainable is something better than what we're doing today. And again, I'll tell you where we get those numbers in a second. So if there's this mysterious attainable number out there, and when I subtract from it what we're actually doing today, we get something we call, and we've coined this phrase, called unclaimed profit. Why is this unclaimed profit so important? Why are we focusing on that as we're coming alongside businesses? Well, if you really understand what goes behind unclaimed profit, you're going to see that unclaimed profit drives three very important things for a business. The first is assuming the business is operating profitably. If we can find this unclaimed profit, we're going to improve the cash flow of the business. If the business is needing a relationship with their bank and maybe getting some financing, we're going to improve their credit worthiness. And finally, the other thing that's going to be impacted if we can find this unclaimed profit, is impacting positively the value of the business itself. Now, this is important because as we try to grow our businesses, the cash that we need to grow our businesses has to come from one of those three places. Either the business itself is going to generate the cash flow, or we're going to go to the bank and get some financing, or we're going to sell some equity and get equity financing. So if we can find this unclaimed profit and improve our business performance to capture it, it would be a really important thing for the business to understand where that unclaimed profit is in any particular business. Let's not talk about this word attainable. Where do we get our numbers? What does attainable mean? Well, we actually, when we do our analysis, we get attainable numbers from two different locations. The first place to look at is we look at the industry benchmarks. Now, you may not be aware of this, but if you have a relationship with a lender and you supply that lender with your financial statements, your lender goes and enters the data from your financial statements into a nationwide database. Obviously, any of your company-specific information is removed, and it's entered by six-digit NAICS codes. So it is managed, this database is managed by a company out of Philadelphia called the Risk Management Association, or RMA for short. And what happens is, is they take all of this data from all of the banks all across the country, they compile it, they sort it, they analyze it, and then they license it back to the banks. So the banks, if you go in for a loan, are going to use this industry compiled data to compare your performance to see if you're operating above your industry averages. Now today, that database is over a quarter of a million businesses, mostly private businesses. And depending on the size of the business, or I'm sorry, the number of businesses 
in a particular NAICS code, data may be available even on a more regional or by company size level. But as much as we always like to look at industry data and say, are we doing as good as our industry or better than our industry? Actually, the more important place that we look for our attainable numbers is the company's own performance. What's interesting is we find many companies who've had a little bit of margin slip over the last couple of years or are collecting the receivables in, in longer periods of time than they did a couple of years ago. And the industry numbers are sometimes interesting, sometimes they're meaningful, but the company performance is always relevant because if we're having slip in margin or having slip in cash flow, hopefully we can help the business understand where those slips have occurred so we can capture that profitability or cash flow back. So let me grab an example here that might help bring some of this together because I wanna show you how if we can help identify this unclaimed profit and make some changes, that those small changes can actually have a very large impact on the financial health of the business. So I'm bringing back my seven cash drivers and we're gonna look at a small company. It's only doing about 5 million in revenue, about 15% return on equity. And I will show you the reports for this company at the end of the presentation. But just trust me that as we looked at the report, the two areas had have the greatest opportunity for improvement for this specific company are in cost of goods sold and inventory. So I'm gonna bring those over to the left. I'm gonna tuck off to the right. I'm gonna bring my equation back up on top. So as we look at cost of goods sold and inventory, let's first look at what is the company actually doing in each of these two areas. Well, when we look at cost of goods sold, we can see the business is operating at 72%. Well, by itself, we don't know if that's good news or bad news. So we look now at what we might view as potentially attainable. It turns out when we look at the industry average, the industry average is 64%. Now you're gonna see later that the difference, this eight point margin difference, is worth to this business over a half a million dollars a year in profitability. Now I'm not saying you, this business can easily achieve the industry average, but it is a data point worth considering. When we look at the company best, and again, you'll see it on their reports, their margins over the last two years have slipped 2.7%. So we already can see that there's been a margin erosion in this business over the last couple of years. So in order to monetize these, in order to understand the value and the reason we should focus and make improvements, we're going to have to set a target, a goal, if you will, for improving both cost of goods sold and inventory. So let's pick halfway between where the company is currently and the industry average. So for cost of goods sold, just for the sake of demonstration here, we're gonna set a target for this business to achieve 68%. Hopefully, since they've already been at 70% just two years ago, that could be something we could attain in a reasonable period of time. I'll move to inventory. It turns out this company's sitting at 106 days. Again, we don't understand yet whether that's news or bad news. When we look at the industry average, the industry average is 83 days. And again, you'll see on the reports that this company has $270,000 more tied up in inventory than should be there for a company of their revenue size. And in fact, this company, which is a real company, obviously we've changed the name, but the real company here actually is in a cash flow crunch. It's because they have so much cash sitting in inventory. When we look at company best, turns out this is the best. They've actually been improving over the last couple of years. So hitting the best isn't going to improve cash flow. And again, I'm not saying this is an easy number to achieve, but in order to understand the impact of making changes, let's set a target for inventory at 90 days. So question comes, if we can make these improvements, what's the impact on the business? Is it worth the effort to be able to look at these two areas, make improvements? What is it going to mean to the financial health of the business? So as I mentioned before, unclaimed profit is going to drive three things. So as we look at the impact of the business, we're going to look at what is impact going to be on the cash flow, 
What is the impact going to be on the debt capacity of the business? And finally, what is the impact going to be on the enterprise valuation itself. So we look just one year out. Now this would be one year after we've achieved those values. So why were we making these changes? Well, it turns out after just one year, we've improved the cash flow of the business by over $200,000. We've improved the debt capacity by over a half a million dollars. The number that's kind of surprising to me is when we look at the value of the business itself, we've improved it by almost 1.2 million. Now, what if we didn't make any changes in the other five cash drivers, but we held these improvements and we just held them in place for five years. We didn't make any further improvements whatsoever. What does this look like at the end of year five? Well, it turns out by the end of year five, We've improved cash flow by 1.5 million. We've improved debt capacity by over a million. And we've added 2.2 million to the enterprise value itself. So we look at those numbers there, 2.2 million in enterprise value, et cetera. As it says at the top of the column, this is the added value from making these changes. So what, but we have to remember that the business existed before. What if they hadn't made any changes? What if they hadn't made any improvements? Turns out at the end of five years, this business without any improvements would have been worth $3.8 million. So when we look at the two combined, focusing on just the cost of goods sold in inventory, making those improvements that are listed on the left-hand side, the business has gone from 3.8 million to almost $6.1 million. And you can see the improvements in the other areas. So this is why we believe if we can help a business understand their performance on the seven cash drivers, we can financially help the business significantly. Now at the same time, I wanna mention that this pendulum swings in both directions. And what I mean by that is these small changes had these tremendous improvements in the business, but the opposite is also true. We get calls from businesses that say, you know, I've only lost a couple of margin points and my cash cycle has only gotten worse by 10 or 15 days, but I've gone from a company that was doing fine to one that I don't know if I can make payroll next week. So clearly what we're seeing here is small changes in either direction have a major impact on the financial health of the business. So our goal is to really come alongside, define these and show the business where their opportunities for improvement are great. One other thing I wanna mention, we do use, as I mentioned earlier, the six digit NAICS code. Now, one of the things that we do that's different than anybody else out there is we actually allow you to pick up to five different codes. So, for example, if there isn't a single code that represents everything you're doing as a business, let's say 50% of your revenue comes from your manufacturing operation and 30% comes from distribution and 20% from retail, well, those are three rather significantly different business concepts. And so what we'll do is we will weight the three different industry codes by their respective percentages in order to give you a custom hybrid mirror image of an industry comparable as we can possibly do. So one more thing that we want to just talk about briefly is not all of the seven cash drivers matter the same to each different business. As we look at the world of industry, we on a highest level, break the world into four different kinds of what we call meta sectors. There's manufacturing, distribution, services, and retail. And as I'm about to show you, clearly the importance of these different cash drivers varies widely based on the type of business. So if I look at a manufacturing business, clearly the, the ones highlighted in the dark green with the triangles are the areas that are most important in controlling to driving forward with improving financial performance. When I move to distribution, it's usually not as much focused on capital expenditures or because they're distribu distributing and not manufacturing, it's not cost of goods sold, but driving sales revenue becomes more important. 
as we look at the service sector, most service businesses that we work with have no inventory. But it also, in some businesses, depending how they, the accounting system that they use to account for the cost of the services providers, many service businesses don't even have cost of goods sold. They capture it all in operating expenses. And depending on the type of business, you may or may not have a significant investment in capital expenditures. So again, here, in fact, for some services businesses, they don't have the seven cash drivers, they have the four cash drivers. And as we move into retail, we can clearly see that if it's true retail and paid for at the time of purchase, there is no accounts receivable. But talk to anybody that owns a grocery store, for example, and seriously controlling inventory, cost of goods sold, and driving revenues are the keys to financial success of those businesses. So as I wrap up now, uh, what we're really trying to do is help a business understand the seven cash drivers of the business. And wherever possible, we want to identify this unclaimed profit. And we want to do that by comparing the business's current actual performance against both their own performance as well as their industry comparables. And we do that because if we've learned that small changes that we can make in key accounts have a significant impact on the financial health of the business. So as I talk now and I'm closing up and we look at the product or the service offering we're working on with Vistage Group, basically what we have for the Vistage Group is any if your Vistage Group decides to work with us, there's a simple Excel spreadsheet. I realize you can't see it very well here, but in this Excel spreadsheet, we're looking for standard accounts off of your financial statements, the revenue, operating expenses, cost of goods sold, AR, AP, et cetera. And what we do then is we take this data from 14 pieces of information and we put it into our software. What happens is you get back Every quarter, we, this is a quarterly process that we go through, you get back every quarter a two-page analysis, one page on the income statement and one page on the balance sheet. Now, I'm going to zero in and show you the reports for the company that we just did the analysis for a couple of slides. When I look at the income statement report, as you can see, revenues and operating expenses are highlighted in green. That just means they're doing great there. Remember I said that we identified cost of goods sold? So let me walk you through the numbers to the right of where cost of goods sold is highlighted. Well, it's supposed to be red, but it's actually a little bit more brown. So what that says, looking at the numbers to the right, that says the company did 4.1 million in its most recent fiscal period in cost of goods sold. That represented 72.7% .7 of sales. The next two numbers, as you can see above on the column headings, this is the company best. Turns out two years ago, the company did 70%. So the member I mentioned that they'd lost 2.7 points of margin. Well, there it is documented right there. Hopefully we can find out what happened to cause us to lose that margin. And if we can just recapture that 2.7% of margin, we're going to add that number that's listed there, 159000 and change, to profitability every year. Now, I'm not saying that the industry average is attainable. Never heard me say that. But here's the, here's the industry number. The industry number is sitting at 63.6%. If we could figure out and get to that number, it would add over a half a million dollars to the profitability every year. We also want to show this graphically because sometimes seeing it graphically, we can see trends and other things that we don't always see in the numbers. So the middle graph there is the cost of goods sold as a percentage of sales. The company is the green line. The industry is the red line. As you can see, the green line for the company is trending up. You can see the farthest right point is 72.78%. The red line, as I said, is the industry. And as an analyst, the most concerning part about that graph is the distance between the, t the green and the red line is getting farther apart. The business is getting worse. The industry is getting better. And the distance between those two lines for this business represents over a half a million dollars of profitability. 
Now, we often also identify areas where the company is doing fantastic. So look at the graph on the right-hand side as operating percentage, operating expense as a percentage of sales. As you can see, again, the company is the green line. That company, even though revenue is going up, is seeing a reduction every year. They're seeing the percentage of revenue going to operating expenses is going down. That is fantastic news. Somebody deserves a high five, a pat on the back, a bonus, who knows what. But clearly, we want to also give credit where credit is due for a business that's doing and achieving improvements in the particular areas. The second page that comes out of this is actually the balance sheet. So let me just quickly go through this. If we look at the inventory numbers, second line down from the top, the company finished last year at 1.2 million of inventory. That was 107 days. As I mentioned earlier, 107 days is the best they've done. So hitting that's not going to add any cash flow. The third set of numbers up on the top says 83 days. That's the industry average. And here's where the business based on their revenue size, is currently spend has almost $270,000 more tied up in inventory than would be uh, normal based on their industry averages. Again, the middle graph and the bottom for inventory days, green line, best it's been in three years. The red line, the industry is getting worse, but the distance between the green and the red line on inventory days is worth $270,000 of cash flow. We also want to deliver something to the group. So we want to be able to facilitate a discussion at the group level. And since we're now comparing a company to itself and its industry, we can actually have an interesting conversation between members of the group. I realize you can't see this next one. I'm going to zero in on it in a second. But along the left-hand side in blue is where we list the companies, the members. Across the top is the seven cash drivers. And the cells that are highlighted in green mean that there's a performance above the comparable. If it's highlighted in pink or red, there's an opportunity for cash flow improvement. Now zero in because the third company down listed as IMA owner is the business we looked at today. So the second column of numbers under cost of goods sold, there's the business's 72.7 current level. There's the industry average at 63% and the profitability that could be achieved if they could hit that number. There's the company best two years ago at 70% and there's the 159,000. The very next column to the right, it shows the fantastic job they're doing on operating expenses. And two more columns over to the right is the inventory, 107 days and the 269,000. So our hope is that using the basic Vistage concept of companies that have solved problems, helping businesses that are having problems, maybe this company we've looked at today can offer some suggestions to the top company there who's having trouble with operating expenses, and maybe some company further down the list that's got cost of goods sold under control can offer some advice and help to this particular business. I also mentioned at the very beginning that our core business strategy is actually coming alongside businesses which are much deeper engagement. I just want to show you what that means graphically. So this pyramid shows basically everything that we do with a business owner when we engage them from uh, capital analysis to enterprise valuation. And all we've done is taken the top 10% of what we normally deliver a client and peeled that off for Vistage groups and performance leadership. So anybody that might have a need or a desire for something in a much deeper level, we certainly have the ability to go there with you. So today we're here focusing on performance insights, specifically performance leadership, where you fill out an Excel spreadsheet Every quarter, you get back a two-page analysis, one on the income statement, one on the balance sheet, and the littler one there that shows is the one that the group at a glance, so we can have and facilitate a group-wide discussion for everybody. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate the opportunity that you've given me today, and please let me know if you have any questions that we can help with.